Okay. It met all. Hey everybody. Um So it's seven o'clock, but I'm going to give a couple minutes um, shortly for anyone who is joining us a little bit later. But welcome to our virtual Third Friday speaker series, which we have Sarah Martin tonight. Um, I'm Sandy Lamb. I work for the Center for Wooden Boats, and I just wanted to remind people to stay muted during this presentation. And if you have any questions at all, um, just drop them in the chat box and we will uh, take the questions at the end. It's been a long day. <laughs> um, and yeah, that intro was much shorter than I thought it was going to be. But <laughs> How's everybody doing? Good. Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah this is really fun to see so many faces we haven't seen in a while it's kind of fun once you know while cdv has been closed once a month we do these virtual third fridays and we get to see everybody once a month all together in one big room it's fun oh and for those of you who don't know um right now we are in the middle of our 45th anniversary gala and auction so there is an online auction happening right now. If you go to our homepage, cwb.org, there's a button that will take you straight to the auction. And tomorrow night we have a live stream party broadcast and you can watch it from the website um, or you can email me and I can send you a link to join us via Zoom as well. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know about that. And um, this presentation is perfect for our theme of connecting generations and celebrating our history. So um, 702, do you want me, I'm gonna pass it off to you, Josh. Oh, sure. Let's start talking, why not? <laughs> Forwarding the email, I'm getting a bunch of emails right now from people who want the link. Because <laughs> of course that's how it <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's see here. Well, thank you to everyone who's uh, joining us here for um, the third Friday speaker series. Um, as Sandy mentioned, this week is our auction or tomorrow is our um, actual online auction. So hopefully everybody can um, attend. It's gonna be it's gonna be a Zoom chat kind of like this, except you'll all be unmuted so you can talk to one another. Um, we have a really cool um, digital scan of the entire floating campus and the Wagner Education Center. So um, you'll be able to walk around and click on all sorts of links and learn history about the various boats and um, different types of things that we have at Center for Wooden Boats. So um, should be a lot of fun. And then we'll do a live stream tomorrow night as well. Um, I think that will go live at 6.30. Um, we'll have a link on our website or hopefully you're registered. So you'll be able to see all of that as well. So um, should be a good time. But uh, today, so I mean, this year is the Center for Wooden Boats is uh, 45th anniversary. And um, one of the special things that we're doing this year to help celebrate our uh, anniversary um, is that we started undergoing a process to landmark our floating buildings um, with the city of Seattle. Um, and so that whole process and the history behind the buildings um, is what our guest speaker tonight, Sarah Martin, um, is going to talk to you all about. Um, so a little backstory on why we're doing this um, and how it all kind of came about. Um, so I don't even remember how long ago it was now, but um, Brant Botts, the former executive director, and I um, met with Jeff Murdoch um, from Historic Seattle. Um, Jeff is the one who called the meeting. Um, and this is back when Brant was still the executive director and you could meet with people, mind you. So it was long enough ago. <laughs> um, but um, basically, um, Colleen Wagner had actually, if my memory serves me right, Colleen Wagner um, 
before she passed, had started the process of wanting to landmark her floating home, um, the you know the Wagner family uh, family floating home um, where the Center for Wooden Boats started, uh, the old boathouse, um, with the city of Seattle, and had envisioned um, our floating buildings at CWB, the boathouse and the boat shop specifically, uh, to be part of that um, landmarking process or to do it ourselves. Um, and so she had kind of got the wheels in motion for that process to happen. Um, you know, of course, she passed away almost two years ago at this point. Um, and that's kind of like the background on why Jeff Murdoch came and talked to Brant and I. And it was just like, basically just like, you guys should do this. It's really important. Um, and he helped explain the process to us and how it could really help um, highlight the Center for Wooden Boats, the floating community, and then also like help preserve the floating buildings for the future um, because they are unique and important to this city and really help tell a story about it all. Um, and so from that, we started going down a process, um, including applying for a grant um, with Four Culture um, from in the city of C or King County. Um, and a huge thank you to Four Culture for making this happen and awarding us the grant but to basically fund the entire process of going through the landmarking process, um, helping you know, fund Sarah to be able to um, submit an application and do all the history and research necessary for the application. Um, and it's a, it's a wonderful document. It's a wonderful um, application that we'll make public to all of you um, really shortly here. Um, to move forward, uh, really a detailed history of the Center for Wooden Boats. Um, but basically we have a meeting now scheduled with uh, the city of Seattle for the landmarking process scheduled on April 21. Um, there's a comment period. So any of you watching now or in the future um, can comment to the city of Seattle and recommend that this building, that these buildings and the Center for Wooden Boats are in fact important and should be preserved. Um, and we have a whole web page dedicated to it that um, we'll drop in the link and um, we'll be on our website um, you know, in, the, in the new section at cwb.org uh, with, with this recording afterwards, the application, um, how to contact the city, um, and just a description of the process as it goes forward. Um, and so I think kind of with that, I will hand it off to Sarah. Great. Thank you, Josh. Um, I'm really excited to be able to be with you guys tonight and talk a little history. Um, uh, my name is Sarah Martin and I am a public historian. Um, I specialize in documenting the built environment and how places sort of change over time. And I write landmark applications and cultural resource reports, but I, I especially love local history and storytelling. And I feel like the Center for Wooden Boats is kind of a mix of all of that. So it's been a really fun project so far to be involved in. So I wanna thank uh, the center for that opportunity. Um, so before we jump into anything serious, I am a relative newcomer to Seattle. Um, I moved here in, in June of 2015. My husband took a job at the University of Washington. And, and um, this, this picture is literally my first weekend uh, in Seattle. So I have to thank the Center for Wooden Boats. We somehow found our way to the Sunday public sale. And, and um, Seattle afforded us a, a really beautiful um, early June summer day, and I won't ever forget that first weekend. The weather was picture perfect, as you can see, and we were treated to uh, a spin around the lake on the Friendship Sloop Ami. Um, it was it was really exhilarating. You know, it was our first time out on the lake, and you know, for first timers having having the, the kayaks and the paddle boards and the seaplanes sort of all around you was was a bit of a sensory overload for us on our first uh, spin around the lake. I've been out many times since and now I kind of understand the busyness of the urban lake, but but I, I want to give a quick shout out and thanks to the center for such a, a memorable first weekend for us in, in Seattle a few years ago. So kudos to you guys. So as, as Josh sort of mentioned, we can, we can tip our hats to Colleen Wagner tonight. It's, it's, it's because of her that we're, we're having this discussion tonight. She really set into motion uh, before her death um, 
in early 2020, I believe, um, she set into motion this project to, to, to landmark both the Wagner Floating Home and um, the Center for Wooden Boats. So we can't not think of Colleen tonight when we're, we're talking about these properties. So it's, it's on behalf of the Center for Wooden Boats and the Wagner family with, as Josh mentioned, the support of War Culture and Historic Seattle that I was hired to, to prepare landmark applications for both, both properties. And they're two separate applications, um, but as you can imagine, there's a lot of overlap in the history that's presented in the applications. And we'll, we'll touch on those uh, a bit this evening. And, and as we go through the talk tonight, if you have questions about what you see on the slides, you know, drop them in the chat box. I did include little numbers at the bottom of the slides um, if, if you have a question about a specific photograph, just, just maybe mention that number and we can scroll back to it. A, a little bit about the landmark program really quickly. This is a city of Seattle program. Um, it's managed by the city's historic preservation staff and they are housed within the Department of Neighborhoods. And there are all kinds of different properties uh, designated, um, including buildings, sites, structures, objects, um, but but no floating buildings yet. So this is kind of kind of path breaking and really exciting. It's a little surprising given given Seattle's rich history on the water. But the landmark the landmark process begins with a nomination report, which is kind of the where we're at in the process. As Josh mentioned, we've been scheduled for um, both applications to be considered by the Landmarks Preservation Board on April 21st. That's a, a Wednesday. I think the meetings usually start around 3.30 in the afternoon. And it will be a, a virtual public meeting, kind of a, a Zoom affair. So you're welcome to tune in. You're also welcome to um, submit public comment, support. And of course, Josh and the center and, and Sandy have, have done a great job kind of putting together a website to facilitate anyone who wants to do that. So um, watch your email inboxes for more information on, on, on that. So, you know, if we're successful and, and hopefully we will be at the April 21st hearing, there is a second, what they call a designation hearing. And um, I've been told that that will probably be in early June, but there will be a kind of a follow-up public meeting. It's just a second step in the process. So you might just keep, keep that in mind if you're interested. So I'd like to, to touch briefly on some of my favorite um, sources that I, I referred to when I put the applications together. Um, I, I tell a little bit of Lake Union history. You can't talk about the center and, and the Wagner floating home without talking about Lake Union. And so I, I really recommend uh, picking up the book Waterway by David Williams and Jennifer Ott and the History Link staff. Um, it's a recent book, 2017. I think it was published um, to commemorate the, the 100th anniversary of the, the ship canal opening. So that's a great resource. Um, you can't not read Dick Wagner's book, Legends of the Lake. Um, I really enjoyed reading that just for, for his voice in particular, but he's such a great storyteller. And this is basically a collection of of essays, and it really speaks to his um, his deep interest in, in all facets of, of Lake Union history. So I think that might even be in the, the bookshop um, there at the center if you're interested in picking it up. And then to tell a little bit of, of the center's story, um, um, the newsletter Shavings, which started back in November 1978, and it was published basically every couple of months. And, and, and Dick Wagner himself had uh, sort of a, a, a column every, every month, uh, every issue in, in the newsletter where he just talked about the organization and the campus and how, how things were developing. So it was a really good sort of blow by blow of what was happening uh, with the organization. And I think all those most of those are, are available online. So it was helpful during, especially the pandemic when I can't get into to library so much. So um, Shavings newsletter was excellent as was the collections of both the Center for Wooden Boats and the Wagner family. They were most helpful in pulling together photographs and 
and documents and drawings to help me kind of sift through the story and create the narrative. And then also um, for the Wagner floating home in particular, um, so much great history is told in Howard Droker's book, Seattle's Unsinkable Houseboats. It was a little hard for me to get a hold of that book, but, but um, Josh tracked down a, a copy that was loaned to me. So um, it's a little dated now. It was published in 1977, but it's an excellent detailed history of Seattle's houseboat community. And then following up on that was the recent publication. It's about a decade old now, the Seattle Floating Homes Pictorial History by Aaron Feeney. It kind of picks up where, where Droker left off. So those are excellent books. And then the Floating Homes Association has a really great website with lots of history. Um, their newsletter goes back to 1963, I believe. So um, again, if you're wanting sort of a, a minute by minute uh, history of, of all the issues surrounding floating homes in Seattle, that's a great resource. And we're lucky that it's on um, digitized on the web. So that's just kind of a brief rundown of the sources. Each application I put together has a really detailed bibliography and footnotes. And if you're curious, you can kind of dig into those a little deeper. So the center's um, South Lake Union campus, it, it developed over many years. Um, it was largely under the leadership of Dick Wagner and the, the Center for Wooden Boats board. Um, both Dick and Colleen were really masterful at inspiring people, um, bringing them together and, and working around sort of a common vision. And it's this year, as Josh mentioned, that we're celebrating 45 years of the center's uh, organization. It was in 1976 that the Wagners began hosting in their houseboat uh, monthly gatherings of, of boat enthusiasts. Um, and, and they basically mapped the course for what would become the Center for Wooden Boats. And, and it was their floating home they called the old houseboat, sorry, the old boathouse, um, where they, they held these monthly meetings. And it was basically an incubator for this organization. So their search for a permanent home began in the late 70s and early 80s. And that really coincided with an important an important time in Lake Union history when um, an increasing number of competing interests were really vying for shoreline space uh, around the lake. So you had water dependent businesses like the old boat shops um, and then the old floating home communities. And then you had the industry like asphalt plants um, and, and all of this was competing for um, shoreline space with um, new um, um, private developments like you see here with, with restaurants. So all of this is happening. Then Dick Wagner and the Center for Wooden Boats walk in and they're ab advocating largely for public access to the lake. And so it's with that sort of story that I'd like to kind of jump into um, a little bit of Lake Union history because you can't, again, talk about the center without um, understanding sort of how Lake Union came what it is today. So let's let's start there. As, as Dick demonstrated in his book, Legends of the Lake, um, there are many chapters in the lake's history and it, it's really sustained people um, in one way or another for hundreds of years. And early on, it was an important place for the native Duwamish people. They, they settled both seasonal and permanent settlements um, along the shores um, of all of the area's bodies of water, including Lake Union. Um, and they connected them through a series of transportation networks. So this image is from 1891, and, and this shows it a little later, but David Denny and, and Thomas Mercer were early settlers. Their families arrived in the mid 19th century. And they were the first to sort of stake claims um, down at the south end of the lake and in the Queen Anne neighborhood. So they saw great potential um, in Lake Union being a, sort of a transportation network connecting both Lake Washington on the, on the east and, and Salmon Bay on the west with, with Puget Sound. 
So an early improvement in, in the lake, um, one that's reflected in, in this image, um, was actually completed by Chinese laborers. They, they dug small canals um, connecting Lake Union with um, Lake Washington on the east and Salmon Bay on the west. And um, this allowed for um, um, logs that were, were um, um, cut in the, in, the, in the hills to be basically shipped through the canals and down to the south end of Lake Union, where you can see in this image, um, the mill is going quite strong by this point. It's, um, it started in 1882 and it became the Western Mill Company. So logs were floated down basically Lake Union to, to, this, to this point. It's a very industrial space at the end, south end of the lake early, early on. And this image kind of reflects what it looked like um, in, in about 1885. So this industrial area at the south end of the lake was, was largely associated with the Cascade neighborhood. Um, this was home to um, Russians, Swedes, Greeks, um, kind of a melting pot of, of immigrants, many of whom worked in the mill and then also in the lake sh lakeside shops. So the based map on the right is dated 1912, and you can see along the west side of the lake, um, the streetcar line. It's, it's already, um, it was developed early on in, in roughly 1890. Um, so, so 1912, that map that you see is, is sort of showing the south end of the lake really on the verge of, of the ship canal opening. So it's starting to to develop, you can see some industry filling in uh, along the shorelines. So I really, I really love this map. It's 1930. Um, it, you know, the ship canal opened in 1917, and activity around the lake is is really picking up after the ship canal opens. Um, new bridges were built at Ballard, Fremont. Um, Mott Lake and, and the University District, um, all, all able to accommodate uh, boats coming through the new ship canal. So these changes are happening also to the lake itself. Um, we see nearly two dozen um, water access points cut into the shoreline at this point. That was to accommodate um, the business and industry that, that rings the lake. And then of course, more maritime related industry is, is appearing on the lake during this time. Um, the Lake Union dry dock in 1919 and an assortment of small boat yards that we're probably all familiar with, the Blanchards, the Grandies. Um, and, and so this map actually drawn by Dick Wagner himself sort of captures Lake Union in 1930. Um, it shows the variety of industry kind of around the lake and, and it really captures the heyday of the lake. And it's right before the Aurora Bridge is built sort of closing off the lake to those really tall masted ships. So um, the heyday of the, of the lake in terms of its industry and boat building was, was basically between 1917 and, and around um, the end of World War II. So with this increased um, industry um, comes the need for sort of cheap worker housing. And by 1914, there were a couple hundred uh, floating homes on the lake. They were largely just cheap floating shacks, really. Um, these two photos give a real sense, um, sort of from the 20s and 30s, give a real sense of kind of the grittiness and the, and the chaos that, that was the working waterfront of, of Lake Union. And it's interesting, the photo on the right shows um, the south base of Aurora, the Aurora Bridge just as it's being built. And this is where the Wagner floating home would, would eventually, um, it wasn't here in 1931, it was floated in in the late 30s, but this is where it would wind up just a few years later. So by the late 1940s, um, Lake Union was, was one of the busiest and most highly developed industrial parts of the city. 
there were five flying services using the lake and there were numerous boat yards jockeying for shoreline space. And there were roughly, estimates vary, but there were roughly a thousand floating homes um, along the shorelines. So this photo was taken in 1950. You can see at the north end of the lake on the left is the old gas plant. And it, it closes just a few years after this photo was taken. But real significant change is on the horizon for, for the lake at this point. Elsewhere in the city and, and on the outskirts of town, there are um, suburban um, family subdivisions being developed. Um, at a real rapid pace and, and small towns were incorporating and annexing large tracts. Um, real estate agents were really promoting that single family suburban lifestyle, um, largely to sort of white middle class uh, Americans at that point. So this is happening at the same time that, that there's a subset of people who are still attracted to on the water living and they are um, they're still in search of sort of cheap, convenient, um, affordable um, um, housing. And it's interesting, Dick Wagner um, describes these people. It's, it's transitioning after the war to be more um, writers and artists and, and what the literature calls um, the bohemian types. Um, but but Dick, Dick described them in his essay in his book as um, as those whose common denominator was an encompassing love of life and a tolerance for poverty. So, so there's starting to be a change in the type of people that are attracted to houseboat living. And the arrow in this photo points to um, the Wagner houseboat. They weren't yet living in it in 1950. They, they'd show up in this neighborhood just, just about a decade later, but it gives you a sense of kind of the history that they were they were stepping into. So I want to transition into the story of the Wagners, and I'm I'm sure you know many of you knew them personally. I I regret you know that I didn't get a chance to meet at least Colleen. She she passed away just a few uh, months before I was hired onto the project, but um, but I enjoyed getting to know her sons, and they relayed as you know many of the family stories that. I wish I could have heard from Colleen herself as well. But the history that Dick and, and Colleen are stepping into um, um, was one of, of great transition. Um, the gas plant there at the north end of the lake had just closed. Um, Dick Wagner shows up on the scene in um, the late 1950s. He's, he's fresh out of architecture school um, from the East Coast. Um, he's rented a houseboat uh, along Westlake Avenue, probably one of those that we saw in the photo a few minutes ago. And it's his houseboat was across from another houseboat where a group of young women were living at the time. One of them was Colleen Lubke, who was uh, again herself fresh out of school and she was an art teacher. So um, Dick and Colleen met around the time that Dick purchased his first, um, his first boat. It was a 24 foot schooner. It was designed by shipwright um, Bill Garden. And so Colleen and her housemates, and this is sort of how, how Dick tells it. Um, it didn't take much urging. Um, um, Colleen and her housemates readily came over to help him sand and paint his boat in exchange for all going out sailing. And they had great fun doing so. And it was, it was Colleen though that he was drawn to and they married in 1965 and they made her rented houseboat um, their permanent family home. And as um, David and Michael Wagner, their sons tell it, they, they purchased the home for, for just $500. And they, they continued to pay rent on the moorage um, um, until it turned cooperative in, in the 80s. So it was in these early years, um, the 1960s, that Dick worked as an architect. He, um, for at least a, a period, worked with Fred Bassetti, who is familiar to, to many um, in the Pacific Northwest architecture world. He was quite influential 
um, Fred Bassetti was, and, and Dick could have easily paved a path of success working alongside um, Bassetti and his colleagues. But in 1968, um, Dick actually pivoted away from architecture. He, he was unfulfilled by the work and he was drawn to um, sort of what he saw as, a, as a, um, something that was disappearing, these traditional wooden boats. And so he, with Colleen's urging and blessing, um, decided to open a boat livery business out of their floating home. And Dick and Colleen were witnessing, you know, all these old boat shops and craftsmen and, and traditional wood, wooden boats disappearing around them, just sort of one by one. And, and they didn't want to lose that. I think that's what really sparked their interest to, to, um, to transition to the boat livery business. So within a few decades, sorry, within a few, um, a few years, they owned a couple dozen uh, wooden boats. Um, and, and it was really, you know, these are two very artistic people and, and they, they channeled their creativity and design into um, this deepening love of, of traditional boats and maritime history. So, so Dick's earliest sketches of, of what his vision for um, a maritime heritage center on Lake Union would look like date, date to the late 1960s. And he drafted many versions of what such a place would look like. And this is just one example. Um, it was published in the, the Floating Homes Association newsletter in 1969. And it was his idea of what perhaps the gas, the gas plant site that had closed could, could be. Obviously it didn't work out that way. And, and uh, we very much love Gasworks Park today, but. Um, but this is just one example of his, of what he was thinking and how early he was thinking about it. So with all these aspirations for, for a new site, um, Wagner purchased the old and quite dilapidated Leshy Boathouse. Um, this was in 1969. And with the hopes of restoring it into a, a boat livery, an art gallery, and a cafe. And the structure had, had been on Lake Union, or sorry, Lake Washington historically. It, it sat over um, off of Leshy Park um, for about 20 years from 1905 to 1925. So, so Dick purchases this, this uh, old boathouse and he has it towed over to the old Grandy Boatworks Company, which is not far from, from their houseboat on, on Lake Union in 1970. And sadly, it was, it was a, about half restored. He put a ton of effort into it um, when it caught fire and was completely destroyed in January, 1971. So I see this as kind of the, the first real big setback, especially emotionally for, for the Wagners. Um, they had to kind of reassess what their, their plans were going forward at this point. So they, they continued, they, they operated out of their boathouse, their, their boat rental business, and they continued, you see snippets in the papers of them advertising their, their business. And it was, um, it was called the old boathouse. And, and Dick actually, he later described um, this kind of mid seventies um, organization at this point as, as the kindergarten of, her of, of maritime heritage museums. He said that we not only taught our visitors how to row, paddle and sail traditional boats, but we also had Saturday regattas at our floating home. So this is just kind of a, an image of what that, what that may have looked like in the seventies. And, and so, uh, um, it was in 1976, which is what we're kind of celebrating 45 uh, years of, of history, um, that the Wagners began um, hosting monthly meetings um, of fellow boat uh, enthusiasts in their home. And these meetings were held incidentally on the third Friday of every month, just like we're meeting tonight. And this newspaper clipping is, is sort of describing one of those meetings and, and the types of people who, who would have been attending them. So um, it's kind of great that we're meeting 45 years later on a 
third Friday of the month, just like they did. So a, a real turning point for the group came in, um, in 1977 when uh, John Gardner, who was um, considered sort of the father of wooden, uh, the wooden boat revival on the East Coast, he, he made a visit to the West Coast and he had a, a speaking engagement at, at, uh, in Olympia. But Dick, Dick convinced him to come up and talk to his group in Seattle. And it was out of this discussion that the group um, planned their first public event. It was the Wooden Boat Show at the Lake Union Naval Reserve Base. And it was in June, June, July of 1977. And incidentally, we'll have the 44th anniversary event of this, this same event later, later this year. So it was, um, it was John Gardner who, who Dick really credits with sort of planting the seed and, and jumpstarting um, efforts to, to create the center. And Dick kept in close touch with, with um, Gardner over the years. Gardner died in 1995, and, and Dick penned this really moving tribute to his friend. It's the, the cover of the November 1995 um, Shavings newsletter. And in it, he called Gardner the patron saint of the Center for Wooden Boats. So I kind of point to Gardner as, as a real important figure in the Center's early history. So it was with that that the Center for Wooden Boats formed. And it's interesting, this is a, a kind of the cover page of the Articles of Incorporation. And I think these are on, on the center's website, if I'm not mistaken. But the group, um, the group made it official in 1978 when these six individuals listed on the screen um, signed the official incorporation papers. And last summer, I had a chance to talk to um, one of the founders, Marty Loken, and he it was really interesting talking to him. He said, and this is, I found this in all the things I was reading and seeing um, as well, but he said the center is pretty much what Dick and Colleen imagined and doodled on the backs of envelopes in the 1970s. They had a surprisingly clear vision of what it could be. And I, I think that absolutely rings true. And you can see that's that that kind of shows through in in the purpose that I've, I've pulled out from the document here. Um, it sounds just like today's organization still so So the group knew this is these are photos of uh, of the Center before it, it left the old boathouse over at the Wagner's floating home. Um, but the, the group knew that they would need a, a permanent location because they're their activities and their programs were quickly outgrowing their space at the Wagner's houseboat. So the center, um, the board settled on, on waterway four, which is down at the south end of the lake where you're at today. Um, they presented their, their plan and, and request for permits to the city in April of 1980. And it was just a few weeks after they submitted their, their permit request that the old boathouse at um, the Wagner floating home was forced to, to close. And as Dick put it, um, it was because of a lease problem. I think he was having um, challenges with, with um, the landlord. So in June, as this, as this picture of, of Dick kind of shows, an emotional and upset Wagner delivered all of the, the, all the sailboats that they had um, collected over the years, um, they delivered them to friends um, who, who were living on the water at the time to care for the boats while they looked for a permanent home. So I, I, I think this is kind of the second major setback that, that Dick faced personally. And you can really see it come through in that photograph. And, Here's kind of a, a cobbled together photo, but this is this is what the board, this is what they were after. This is Waterway Four, and it's funny. Um, Dick Dick describes it in one of the newsletters as a pothole wasteland, and he wasn't kidding. It was it was an old asphalt plant that the city owned, and um, it had it had potential, and he saw that there were actually several Lake Union groups. Um, 
who had been eyeing this, this waterway for years, the, the Floating Homes Association, the Lake Union Association, they all saw it as, as a, a real potential for, um, for a park location. So again, it was Marty Loken who told me that, you know, it was only through pure persistence that, that the center even ended up at Waterway 4. And it's, it's so true because they needed a mountain of permits um, to get access to, to the waterway. And, and it's, it's kind of funny, Wagner's frustration with, with the bureaucracy, it really filters through in, in nearly every issue of the Shavings newsletter from 1980 through 1983, basically. So um, in one example, he said of, of the kind of the permit process, he said it involved so many memos, studies and reports that it was like a visit to a distant planet where the breath of life was paper, <laughs> which I, as one who's worked in public service, I could, I could kind of relate to, honestly. So I was actually, you know, having read all of these frustrations that Dick was, was kind of publicly airing in his newsletter, I was, um, I was actually really delighted to have um, the account of someone else on the other side of the story, someone who worked in the city, um, the city's Department of Construction and Land Use, and that was Elsie Holsizer. And Elsie is actually on the Center for Wooden Boats board and has been since 2009. But at the time, she was a senior land use planner, sorry, a, a senior land use specialist. And her, her position, as she puts it, gave her a ringside seat for observing the controversies around the development taking place in South Lake Union. So, so Elsie, just uh, within the last couple of years has, has penned this really great you know, 10, 15 page essay um, of her perspective of this exact same process, um, watching, watching Dick go through the, the permit process from the other side. So Elsie actually met Dick Wagner the day he brought the city plans um, for Waterway 4. She recalled his enthusiasm as he unrolled the set of plans and he, he was explaining to her the, the docks and the buildings and he was doing so as if he expected to move in tomorrow. But as it turned out, this application was really an early test of, of Seattle's shoreline management program. It was a brand new program adopted just a few years earlier and and it included sort of goals and priorities and, and regulations for, for how the lake was, was to be used. And so the program, as, as Elsie said, was, was really ground zero for, for issues all around the lake, um, kind, of, kind of flare ups between water dependent uses versus non-water dependent uses and, and the shipyards versus the marinas. And, and sort of recreation versus industry. And then and, in and walks Dick Wagner with his ideas. And, and that's why it took um, basically three years for them to get, to get access to, to Waterway 4. So meanwhile, while the, the permit process is, is ongoing, um, Dick is out fundraising, he's, he's continuing to, to to draw new sketches and plans and refine his, his ideas and his pitches. And it's at this point, sort of in 1981, 82, where he uh, runs into a couple from California named Lon and, and Mary Israel. And they were kind of taken by his um, and, and the organization's um, vision and mission um, for a new hands-on small craft museum. And so Wagner basically convinces them that this is, this is gonna be a, a great place. They, they come back two weeks later with a check for $40,000 um, through their, their foundation, the Oakmead Foundation. So it was, was this couple from California who, who um, helped Dick and the Center for Wooden Boats really launch their vision into, into reality. And, and it gave them their first um, building and then seed money for the next couple of, of buildings after that. So still without a permit um, in 1982, 
Dick set into motion constructing the boat shop. Um, they hired Camelot Construction of Redmond and they took an existing floating structure and they stripped it down to the log flotation and rebuilt it as the boat shop that Dick had been sort of sketching and drawing for years. And the work was all done off site. Um, they didn't have access to Waterway Fort yet. So um, it wasn't until the first permits um, started to be approved in December, 1982, that things really started to fall into place. Um, <laughs> Dick said of the process, they're, they're just now getting their permits approved. Um, by, by sort of spring of 1983, he can see the light at the end of the tunnel. And he recalled of this process at the end of it, he said, our slow steps through the halls of bureaucracy broke a trail. Other organizations can follow our path to their neglected waterways and revitalize them for greater public benefits. Words, drawings, patience, and a sense of humor were the equipment we used to scale Mount Permit. So he was, he was definitely um, on a high at this point. Um, um, and they towed the, the boat shop into uh, Waterway 4 in, just in time for the, the boating season to, to open up in 1983. So they didn't, they didn't rest, they couldn't. Um, they immediately turned their attention to improving the shoreline. Um, this is a, a kind of a snapshot of the drawings for their, their next permit application, which was the Shoreside Pavilion. Um, Dick included these little sketches you can see at the bottom there of, of all the buildings he was hoping to, to add to the site um, in the coming years. And it would take another six years before they would all be built and, and the site would be fully realized. So he stretched every dollar and he maximized volunteer and in-kind support. Um, for the pavilion specifically, he enlisted the Seattle Central College and their, their students in the carpentry and boat building um, classes to build the structure. And then he got donated materials for the roof and, and he had somebody else, um, actually a center, volunteer named Jim, Jim Buckland uh, build the ore house uh, in 1984 as well. So the, the pieces were starting to fall into place um, by 1985. And that's the, the aerial image you see here is, is sort of as those pieces are just put into place. We've got the pavilion on the shore side and the, the boat shop. And then the little ore house you can see um, without its additions is, is there at the north side of, of the boat shop. This is also, um, um, the photo on the left does not show what the photo on the right does. The, the, the tall three-masted um, Wawona um, wooden ship um, was towed into the site um, for preservation purposes in, in 1986. We'll talk about that here a little more shortly. It also shows here the, I forgot, the, the aerial image shows the old um, glass plant that was um, adjacent. This building came down in, in 1990. So it's still, still in 1985, it's very much, South Lake Union is, is very much transitioning. Um, there's still definite elements of the old industrial South Lake Union, but you're starting to see sort of new pockets of development um, popping up. So a real, a real transition. And this shows um, a few more images of the early site, just as, as the landscaping's being laid down, um, the parking areas, and then the pavilion here in the photo on the right. So for um, the next main building, um, the center didn't, didn't stop fundraising, didn't stop promoting their, their programs. Um, Dick actually secured a couple of sizable grants in um, the mid 80s that, that financed the next piece of, of the campus. He got a, a grant from Burlington Northern Foundation and another one from Oakmead Foundation that, that funded the, what they called the education building, but what we call the, the boathouse today. And it was um, 
the drawings were done by Keith Vaughn Associates, but and and that architecture firm kind of helped the center work through the permit process. But but the buildings were all the design um, of all the earlier sketches that Dick had done um, years earlier. And they contracted again, the same construction company that had built the boat shop, uh, Camelot Construction. This time the, the boathouse was constructed on site. Um, it was finished in late 1988 and was dedicated in 1989. I really love the photo on the left, it shows how busy and how crowded um, um, the campus was at this point. It was a real lively place. And you, again, you can see the Wawona schooner kind of squeezed in there. Um, I think I got a couple of better photos here in the next slide. So the Wawona was at the site um, from 1986 to 2009. Um, it had actually, efforts to save this had gone back to the 1960s. Um, a group formed just to try and save this ship called Save Our Ships. And it was led by some real, um, some real well-known characters, um, Kay Bullet, Wing Luke, Ivor Hagland. Um, they all formed to try and save, save this, this kind of amazing ship. And it was, it was that group of, of people in particular that, that became the Northwest Seaport which today, as you know, maintains the floating fleet that's moored there at, at uh, Lake Union Park. And Colleen in particular was, was really involved not only with the Wawona, but also um, with Northwest Seaport. And um, there are, are, are notes of her um, organizing tours on the Wawona, all, all in public, um, all to try and get public support to save the ship, but it, it did not make it. It was actually dismantled in 2009. So that's when it left um, the site and it left a real kind of open space there at the, the shoreline. So this is um, the site today, basically. The, the long-term vision of the campus was, was finally realized in 1989 with the completion of the boathouse, although, um, the site itself continued to change and evolve, and it, and it should. It's a living history and living heritage museum, so it needs to change with its, its programs. Um, in 2007, the red cedar totem pole was built on the shore side. Um, the, the portable carving shed was added in 2008, and there were two open air floating classrooms added at the same time in 2008. So as I said, the Wawona was removed in 2009, making way for um, kind of a rearrangement of the floating docks and the buildings are now kind of in, in a new position, reflecting, uh, giving them a little more space really to, to, to breathe and, and for the boats. So it, it has been basically in this uh, configuration since 2011. And then of course, the Wagner Education Center completed just, just recently there at the bottom left. So it was in the 1990s that the organization with their campus sort of complete that they were able to focus on, on their programming and their operations and they hired staff and, and they kind of built out their organization on that front. Um, they were constantly refining programming to emphasize education and hands-on experiences. And they did so through a real variety of, of activities that reached all kinds of people. And it was interesting to go back in the newsletters. Um, they always did sort of an annual report, a recap um, in, in the December newsletters, sometimes the January newsletters. And in 19, I, I, I wanted to, to capture 1995 because it was, I thought it was it was it was so mid '90s um, in what they were doing. Um, they they hosted a year round sailing instruction for homeless teenagers. They did weekly boat rides for people with AIDS. They did sailing instruction um, programs with local schools, and they did an all aboard they called it, which was when they had ten to fifteen at risk teenagers participating in summer long sailing, rowing, and, 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 steam, and seamanship um, um, instruction. So they were doing all kinds of programs with, with all kinds of different people who may not have been 
necessarily given access to, to the water. So, and I think this is a, a really important legacy of, of Colleen Wagner's in particular, given her emphasis on, on children and education. Um, we can see her, her influence still in the programs today, uh, including the, the popular toy boat building program and the signal flag making activities. So I think that's a real legacy of, of Colleen still today. And then Dick's influence is, is, is most obviously reflected in, in the site itself. Um, he was quite intentional in the buildings and the setting, and, and he wanted it to complement the wooden boats that were moored there. And one thing he later said in an interview that I thought was really important, he said, he said, I just designed what I thought would look good in the scale of the boats that we had where people would not feel overwhelmed by big piles of stone. He said, I wanted them to be small and intimate and easy to feel at home in. I wanted this to be a place where people felt like they were coming back to a little sanctuary that they would feel comfortable in. I wanted them to be built out of wood for obvious reasons and of good craftsmanship. We did well and they were all fun to design. So he was really, really proud of, of the campus and, and what it meant to him in particular. So just to kind of close on his, his significance and the significance of, of the center in general, um, you know, Dick was an architect by training and I think rarely does an architect have the opportunity to refine the design of a property over so many years while influencing its construction, its growth, and its evolution over an entire lifetime. And that's really rare. I don't think I've ever seen that before. And, and Dick had the opportunity with the Center for Wooden Boats. And I think it's truly um, not only his lifetime achievement, but also Colleen's. So I'm when I, when I head to the city to kind of argue the landmark application, I'm very much gonna put the Wagner story at the, at the forefront because I think it, it so reflects both of them as individuals. So I kind of want to wrap it up there and, and leave this um, slide on the on the screen to kind of reflect the 45 years, but I'd be happy to take any questions from anybody um, about the Wagners or the, the center campus. If anybody has any, Sandy, I don't know if I haven't been paying attention to the <laughs> to the chat box much. Yeah, no, that was such a great presentation, Sarah. Um, there's actually no questions in the chat box, but um, if people want to say something, feel free to I'd chime love in. To There's hear a any, small uh, enough group we can. I'd love, I'd love to hear any stories. Um, that was the most fun part for me was when I talked to people, just hearing them kind of reminisce about about Dick and Colleen in there. Sure. I think if you um, stop your shared screen, then we can all go back okay. to the room together and we can see everyone's lovely faces. Yeah. Sarah, you didn't mention uh, the excavation of the soil um, around where the pavilion now rests. Um, and uh, my understanding was that that was Dick and just like so much of the work was Dick and some volunteer friends, um, shovels in hand and uh, skimmed at least a foot of the soil away to uh, mitigate the pollution there where the yeah. asphalt plant was. And I wonder if you uncovered some information about that. Not, not so much about, I mean, I know it was a, a pretty polluted site. Um, I, I did, I ran into more um, exactly what you're describing. It, it just seemed like volunteers um, from service organizations, from the center, network itself did a lot of the heavy lifting. Um, every annual report, Dick always included um, the volunteer hours that went into projects just like that. And it was hundreds and hundreds of volunteer hours. Um, you know, usually when I, when I do a landmark application, I always want to make sure I identify all the people who are <laughs> who are responsible for, for kind of the, the development of the property. It was almost impossible in this, in this instance, but um, in terms of the environmental piece, I didn't, I didn't get so much into that. Um, 
um, I know there was a lot of work that, that went into um, mitigating the asphalt plant though. Uh, there is this question here, Sarah, uh, about if you knew when the Wagner home floated into Lake Union. Yeah, so I think the it, it's not definitive, but I think we we estimate 1938 was roughly when it happened. Um, there's kind of a window 1938 to 1942. Um, so Lake Washington. Um, they kicked off basically um, floating buildings off of Lake Washington beginning, it was kind of a stair-stepped approach beginning in the late thirties and into the early forties. So, um, you know, Dick and Colleen's houseboat is actually, it, it was listed in the National Register of Historic Places back in, clear back in 1982. And actually Dick penned most of that application. And in that he suggests that it was, it was brought over to Lake Union in 19, 38. Um, we know for a fact that it was there by um, 1945 when, um, 45 or 46, when it was was featured in, it was actually featured in Life magazine, which is, is pretty great, um, um, as sort of a, 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 a different way of living. Um, it featured kind of a young um, um, couple with children and, and they had photos of both the interior and the exterior in, in the magazine. But um, the, the short answer is probably 1938 or thereabouts. And it had, it had been, just for, for information, um, it had been, as best we can tell, um, right around the floating, um, the floating buildings colony at, at Madison Park. Uh, the next question is, which criteria will be used in a landmark application to make the case for the designation? Good questions. Um, there are, I think, six different criteria. Um, they touch on sort of all facets of, of how a property could be significant. Um, you know, there's, and they differ from, for instance, the National Register criteria. I think the strongest ones will probably be um, um, for their reflection of important events and, and, and that being sort of the maritime heritage story. I think the other um, strong contender is, is the association with Dick Wagner as an architect and designer. I, I really hope we can go there. Um, those are the two strongest ones. There are other criteria um, that may not fit as well, but I think those are the two, the two strongest ones. The next question I think might be best answered by Josh. Um, there's a question about a concept of a Native American village where canoes would be carved here. Um, they're wondering if there was a follow-up with plants. And I know that there's something that we recently became aware of. So do you want to talk about that, Josh? Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, for the little that I know anyway. I mean, first of all, it was just amazing presentation, Sarah. So thank you. Um, <laughs> One of the other things about Dick Wagner that he helped push forward really was this concept of Lake Union Park and multiple organizations promoting Northwest Maritime heritage and history all together at this historic location. And, you know, obviously one aspect of that is um, the indigenous people's history at that lake, which well predates Western settlers ever coming anywhere near Seattle. Um, and there was always a plan for there to be a Northwest Native Canoe project, uh, like uh, building and campus um, at the other end of the bridge in Lake Union Park along West Lake. And they actually just submitted applications and plans and, and permits uh, to move forward with that project after um, I think a few years of delays. Um, I don't actually know a whole lot more than that, than the public application. We've reached out to them and we're gonna get meetings soon to know more, but uh, this is an ever-growing sort of concept, and it is ever-changing down here. That's um, kind of what makes it unique and a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, next question is, Sarah, for you, and what you think the likelihood that the city will grant CWB and the old boathouse landmark status? I, don't know if you're I, I think 
I mean, I don't want to, I'm biased perhaps, but I think it's, I think it's kind of a shoe in. I think it's such a great, um, it's a great story. It's coming from an applicant that, that wants les landmark designation, <laughs> which sometimes they don't get that. So I think the support of advocates um, will be important in kind of convincing them that this is the right thing to do. But I think um, it's also, you know, for city of Seattle landmark um, criteria, they, they require a property to be, to be at least 25 years old. And this one, you know, is, is kind of on the younger side, honestly. So I think there's a whole lot of interesting pieces to this that they don't typically see. They're, they're used to seeing, um, you know, kind of traditional buildings, um, you know, your, your commercial buildings, your older homes. So I think this one will really kind of, I think it'll be exciting for them. And I think with, with support of advocates like you, I think, I think it's kind of a shoe in personally. We think so too, <laughs> but it's a great story too. It is. Um, next question. I think maybe Josh might be able to help answer. Somebody asked what the importance for designating a site as being historic is. Um, well, actually maybe Sarah, Jeff can help <laughs> explain oh, yeah. how that helps us. And my understanding is, I mean, one, we're, we're on public property and, you know, our leases and waterway for, well, we actually have leases with four different governmental agencies throughout <laughs> the city, uh, which is very, very complicated. But our, our lease of waterway four is um, renews every five years and we have to constantly um, justify why we're occupying public property in a waterway and water and why are we there because it, it does belong to the public it doesn't belong to CWB and I think that um, the landmarking process and the buildings kind of helps provide some context and history about why we're there and why we're important um, and I think it will also help in there, there's larger um, programs and moves afoot um, such as the Maritime Washington National Historic Area um, I think I said that right. Um, that, you know, Washington is a very maritime state and Lake Union is an important part of that and CWB is one little part of that, but we're a public facing part of that. And it helps us tie into the history of just the working waterfront in the state um, and the West Coast in general and the histories. Um, and I'm gonna start rambling, but yeah, that's a, that's a short answer. Yeah, I, I, would, I would echo um, your, your bringing up the, the Maritime Washington National Heritage Area. That's a really important um, initiative. It's a congressional designation that just came across a few years ago. And, and right now, the, the sort of the entity that's, that's um, putting together a, a public plan and they're taking actually right now public comment um, is the Washington Trust for Historic Preservation. They have a, a page dedicated to the Maritime Washington National Heritage Area initiative. And it's not just Seattle, it's, it's basically, um, the designated area is basically um, the, the shorelines, the saltwater shorelines. And then I think as the, as I heard in a public presentation recently, um, Lake Union is just briny enough to be included. So, <laughs> so um, I think that you're absolutely right in, in pointing out your connection and your, your involvement with, with the heritage area. And then two, I think um, landmark designation sort of, it, it re-emphasizes your history and your importance in, in the city's story, but it also, you know, opens, opens up the organization to, you know, some possible grant funding. And that's, you know, to maintain your buildings um, and your site. So I think those, those grants can come through um, for culture. They can come potentially through the heritage area when it's, is a little farther down the track. So yeah, I think, I think it's all positive. Hey, I think there's one, Sarah was dropping links in the chat boxes for people. So um, if you wanna learn more about the maritime heritage areas. Um, last question so far is probably for Josh. Will the new kitten be included in the important events does it qualify as a reviving of a historical boat model? <laughs> I mean, yeah, the building the kit, and just so everyone knows here, we recently built a boat, well, over the span of two years that was um, used, is a historic boat to the Seattle area. It was used by the Seattle Yacht Club in the 20s. There are no sailing versions of the boat left. And 
you know, that's the whole part of CWB being a living museum is, you know, finding these boat designs, building them, and then letting people go and use it again and, you know, experience what people were experiencing a hundred years ago. It's a very tangible aspect to it. Um, and that's what's possible by like having these properties and this location and carrying out the mission um, is to be able to do things like that. <laughs> Hey, Sarah, I've got a question for you. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that the uh, Wagner floating home has been listed in the National Register of Historic Places since 1982. What's the interplay or I guess the difference um, between that and landmark status? Right. And, and this is um, this is sort of I, I suspect I know I don't know this for a fact, but I suspect um, the timing of the National Register application that Dick and Colleen did in, in 19, I think it was the early 80s, it, it, it was officially listed in 1982, but the timing is really interesting because it was around the time that, 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 that the landlord kicked the old boathouse out of the floating home. And I wondered, I just kind of wondered if that, if that had anything to do with why Dick and Colleen um, kind of pursued National Register designation at that point. But the National Register um, in the state of Washington, at least, has it's, it's an honorary designation. There aren't any, um, any reviews that come with that as far as renovations or even if it were to be moved you know, to a different location. So um, I think in, in my understanding with the early conversations with Colleen, she was looking for a way to kind of um, not only further recognize the, the, the history of, of the houseboat itself and, and kind of its connection to the Center for Wooden Boats, but, but also to bring perhaps some added protection and, um, and through the city designation, which does carry more protection um, than, than a national register designation. I, I, I believe that's why Colleen was trying to pursue the Seattle designation. Any other questions? We're small enough groups so people can kind of chime in if you want to unmute yourselves and. Um, hi, this is Leanne Olson and um, I uh, just want to put in a plug for public comment to the Landmarks Preservation Board. <laughs> um, I'm a um, board member of the Queen Anne Historical Society and we will be supporting uh, the nomination and designation. <clears throat> and I'm, uh, also married to a long time CWB volunteer here. Um, sometimes, there, yeah. it's sometime volunteer. <laughs> it has been volunteer, no. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, and so I'm very familiar with uh, the center and um, its importance to the city. But um, I'm also very familiar with the landmark process because I've been attending landmark board meetings for probably almost 20 years now and um, uh, I know how important it is for um, the public to give comment, how um, much it means to board members. Jeff Murdoch was a former board member and president, and he was one of the best they ever had, by the way. And um, <clears throat> so any of you, you know, just write a short letter. You don't even have to attend the meeting. Um, it's, it's really important to the Landmarks Board. And I also want to thank Sarah for her excellent presentation. And I look forward to the nomination here. Thanks. If um, just I wanted to add, if it's helpful at all, um, the floating home community might really be interested in supporting the application. Um, I know lots of folks there, some are realtor and I do a lot of floating homes. I uh, just wanted to provide any help that I can if uh, we need to pull that community together with the Floating Home Association and so on. I don't know if you've been in contact with anybody there, but I know the president personally, he's a friend as well. Great, and, and, and I'm working with the Floating Home side, I'm working with Historic Seattle, so we'll, we'll reach out for sure. Oh well, yeah, thank you. And thanks, Leanne, that was a great plug. It, it really does mean so much for people to be able to share their stories with a historic property. Um, it really is what the process is really all about. So it's great if you can offer um, public comments at the nomination or designation hearing. Um, it really is kind of what provides life to the landmark process. And I, I see, um, Sandy, there was another 
question and maybe I can clarify. Um, uh, Renee had asked um, about the criteria again. And, and when I mentioned, um, you know, one of the criteria involves um, sort of sort of broad patterns and events in history. And um, she's asking, you know, what other events may be included in the criteria? Um, I sort of see the center's um, period of significance sort of beginning at the houseboat and, and carrying through to Waterway 4 today. So I don't, they don't make us define, you know, a period of significance, but that's in my mind, I think 1976 to the present. Um, in terms of, of significant events, I don't know, you know, there's there's the traditional wooden boat festival every every year for the last 44 years and in terms of bringing people together for actual events. Um, but but I think it, it's more representative of of sort of this um, this 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 pattern and um, the emergence of of an appreciation for um, public access to the water and also the, the the traditional wooden boats and keeping those alive. So I think it's that pattern and it's that kind of over time and it's it's the evolution of the organization itself that I would point to as, as significant. Thanks for clarifying that. Um, I will also add here, just because some people have been private messaging me, um, that we will uh, post this presentation online. And um, we created a web page about this landmarking process. Um, and I dropped it in the link here as well. Um, there's information on how you can give public comment. Um, you can email, you can write letters. Um, and I even put in a form in there that you can directly write what you want and it'll automatically technology get sent to the um, Landmark Preservation Board. And we also receive a copy so we can see what you're saying as well. But um, so yeah, you don't even have to open your email. You can just submit it <laughs> from the website. That's great. Um, so yeah, and you know, we've been really heavy in our auction the last couple of weeks, but um, now that we have a date for a public hearing, we'll definitely be um, finding ways to reach out to other parts of members in our communities, um, definitely the Floating Homes Association and whatnot to help us with this process. So you will definitely hear a lot more about this <laughs> in the future. I also want to add in there that we're about to launch another couple weeks here, our next podcast episode, which is solely devoted to this subject, um, where we actually interviewed, we kind of followed in Sarah's footsteps. And we went and interviewed Elsie and Marty Loken nice. and have six words and you can hear it in their own words, you know, kind of tell these stories, uh, which I think is going to be really cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really fun to hear um, people who were there at the time, like in their own voice, um, what things were like back then. So it should be a really special podcast, crossing fingers, we can finish it before the end of the month. Um, but yeah, it'll be great. Anybody else? Well, thank you. Um, thank you, Sarah. It was a wonderful presentation. Um, I'm a newer member of the board and I, I knew most of what you were saying, but the detail was phenomenal. Great. Great. So I'm, I'm, really, um, I'm really hopeful that we'll be um, favorably designated by the city. I, I hope so. The city's so kooky now, so we'll <laughs> have to see. And maybe, I... maybe if we said we were providing some space for homeless people, you know, at the center, we'd have a better chance. But anyway, I, I think um, that it looks like a, a really fabulous effort. And it's an important designation. So I hope we get it. I think we will. Yeah, I'm pretty confident. And, and I think with with a good strong showing of support, it, it should it should go well. So what ha if the um, if the old boathouse is, is designated um, that way, I mean, what does that really mean? Does that mean that it stays there forever and nobody can move it or no? What does it, it mean? It, it largely depends on, so during the, des the, the two hearings, um, the nomination hearing and the designation hearing, the, the board will, will sort of talk about the various designation criteria. Um, they'll talk about what elements of, um, in the case of the floating home, what what physical parts of the home are are character defining? You know, they they will look at 
the exterior, is that the most important? They'll look at the, you know, the interior, is there any reason to, to designate the interior? There's all kinds of things that they'll discuss during those, those two hearings. And so they'll, once they kind of come to a, an agreement on, on what physically is important, um, that will inform sort of the, the types of restrictions that are placed on it. Um, and, and that's negotiated then at the end of the process with the property owner, they, they kind of negotiate with the city um, sort of going forward, what changes can look like. Okay, but that, but that old um, boathouse is still on a, on a leased dock, right? I mean, they don't own, the Wagner's kids don't own that mortgage. It's, it's a leased, somebody it's a it, right? Right. It's a cooperative. Um, so I think, I think there are 10, if I'm not mistaken, 10 um, houseboats that cooperatively own that dock. So there it's, it's sort of, um, um, I think, I think that ownership came into being in the, in the late nineties. It, it was more of a, a renter um, landlord type setup, but now it's a cooperative. Um, just to, to add to that, most of the floating homes in Seattle own their mortgage uh, via co-op. Yeah. And so it, it's a corporation and they issue a share to each of, each of the floating homes, each of the owners. So it's definitely owned land. Yeah. And some of it, some of the space falls on DNR, Department of Natural Resources, um, but most of it is it's owned. Yeah. And now there's no more. I mean, that, that last dock down by, um, well, it's called the College Club now, right? That's, isn't that the last floating home mortgage that's going to be built? I mean, that's how they advertise it. I don't know. And that I'm not, not sure of. I know there's not much left. The realtor knows, you know. <laughs> yes, that Ward's Cove was uh, Ward's the last Cove, one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Ward's Cove. Ward's Cove, yeah. Is that the one on East Lake? Yeah. 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 That's the one that used to be an old salmon packing place, you know. And now... Yeah. Um, yeah, now it's, well, now it's floating homes and it's, I don't know what's in, what's in that old, in that big building there now, something. I don't remember. I've been talking to them because I, uh, anyways, but uh, they're, I think whatever it is, is not going to be there in the next few years, the, the company at least. Oh, interesting. Huh. I think it's an okay, event. Well. Um, Sarah, can, you know, this kind of, and Jeff also, this brings up an interesting point. Um, how, you know, it's sort of akin to um, designating a, a boat, mm -hmm. you know, how can you designate a site with a building? It's the, it's the um, building and the site. So you've got both the center, which is on, you know, leased property, and you've got the um, old boathouse, which is on a leased dock. Um, you know, where would you draw the line? It's yeah, so I know with the center in particular, and this kind of came out of conversations with Je uh, with Josh, um, um, the center specifically, just because there there is a lot of moving parts with the ownership, you know, the, the state owns the waterway and, and, and all kinds of moving parts. So, so the center for wooden boats is wanting to, they're proposing to only landmark the improvements to the property. So the, the built features that basically are 25 years and older. Um, I think that's the pavilion, the ore house, the boat shop and the boat house. I think that's primarily. So um, that's how we're hoping to handle it with the center. And then um, I, I sort of think in my mind, the um, with the floating home, I, I tend to kind of think of it almost like landmarking the, the, the vessels. Um, but then I think that'll be an interesting conversation because the place itself is, is kind of important given, um, given its location on the lake and where, you know, it was the, the first home for the, the old boathouse, the center for wooden boats. So I don't know how they'll, they'll kind of land on the, on the, the site itself, but, um, and, and again, there, you know, when I first called up the city to kind of pick their brains about, about the applications, it's like, well, there, there aren't any other floating buildings currently designated. So we're kind of paving a, a path here. So hopefully we can do it right. I think it's going to be a long meeting. <laughs> <laughs> 
It, it always is. What are you talking about? <laughs> is, it, is it all one application or? It's two, it's two but two. We, we've, um, we've at least got them on the same um, agenda so we could kind of talk about all of these issues together. And, and since okay. their histories are so intertwined, and there's a copy of the application on that web page too that we created. Nice. Good. I'll send everybody um, after we get this uh, meeting or video posted, I'll send everybody a email with the links, all the links that we've talked about tonight. So you can have that. After the auction, right? <laughs> yeah, no, right before Diane, I have plenty of time. <laughs> I'm just sleeping here tonight and <laughs> Gosh. Well, I just, I just, I, I wanted to chime in here and just say thank you. Um, like being able to read through the drafts and what you were working on, and and then even you know hearing tonight and the story and just you know it, it's amazing. You know we've all, we have all these details um, <clears throat> in so many different places, and so it's it's really wonderful to have them all aggregated and put together and kind of just woven into the story and the narrative and the pictures and everything that goes into it. It's, it's, it's really, really quite something wonderful. So I, I, you know, I know Dan's here, but you know, also I think on behalf of the rest of the board, I, we really appreciate all of this because it, it really is something special to see it here put together. Yeah. And I, I wish, I wish Josh, I'm just saying this in, in total fun, but I wish I would have taken a picture that first day I showed up and and I went up to the second floor of the boathouse and there's, you know, the, the library or whatever we call it is um, this giant table and there's just a mountain of boxes. And I'm like, they're like, oh, it hasn't been gone through yet. And I was like, <laughs> so, so uh, it was a little intimidating at that point, but I think we finally kind of sifted out most of what we needed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just, it's amazing the amount of stuff. And I, I appreciate it. I mean, I know we all do that the, the, uh, excursion the, the discovery process you, you've gone through um because it, it really is such an amazing like it's it's a such a cool story like you know talking about so much like history and all the you know the years and the stories that you know i was fortunate i got to sit with dick and hear him about his, tell his side of the story and so it's you know hearing the the story told but all backed up with all the details and the books and the supporting documentation and it just that's not just a uh uh, an old sailor's tale but it, like it, it actually happened like these things actually <laughs> occurred and it's it's really amazing so you know I, I, it, it is appreciated yeah thank you yeah. well and we're so we're, we're so fortunate that we have um audio and video recordings of dick um you know talking about all this stuff i mean that that's just priceless yeah and very well thought out to have done that so we're very lucky, very fortunate. Well, he also wrote a lot and what Sarah's talking about. So when he passed, then when Colleen passed, like no one else in this organization touched any of those files. They were just sat there um, even a couple of years past him. So when Sarah's kind of started this process, that was the first time that someone other than Dick Wagner was opening some of those file cabinets. Um, and even then, like I went through a lot of them, but like just, first glance there's this is like the tip of the iceberg for the amount of information that we have that is currently sitting in bankers boxes because we haven't had a chance to go through any of it or catalog it or do anything so Sarah's kind of got the first run of it all but there's there's a lot there. <laughs> what well, was and lucky you got it out of there before well Hopefully it didn't get too wet when the roof was leaking no 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 nothing's damaged <laughs> okay. what was what was kind of um Kind of amusing i guess was was how detailed dick and and volunteers were in documenting anything that had to do with wooden boats but then their photographs never had a date on them never had names on them. so i spent a lot of time kind of like you know playing that game where you just kind of put things in order kind of guesstimate dates and so a lot of dates in my photos are just Kind of educated guesses so you'll see a lot of circa dates on my photos <laughs> great yeah and i just want to encourage everyone to uh, if you have the chance it's very long but read the application uh because it really reads it's it reads like a history book um it's really really interesting i mean i'm the executive director and 
I've learned a lot from <laughs> this whole process and this document and all the work Sarah's put in. It's really something special to have the time to be able to go through that. Um, it was really great. <laughs> yeah, I took, uh, I printed out the application and like drove up to Bellingham and sat in a park and read through the whole thing in preparation of our podcast. So, I mean, that was how I tried to map an idea of how we were going to create the podcast is using Sarah's application. <laughs> how do we get a hold of, hold of the uh, podcast? Uh, it's not ready yet, <laughs> um, but hopefully it'll be ready soon. Um, we'll probably go through it next week um, to kind of finalize it and get it up. But it will, we usually post it um, in our e-news and we have a web page for our podcast on our, you go to the CW page under the button called In the News. There's Down at the Boathouse, which is the name of our podcast. It's on Spotify. <laughs> it is on Spot. It's on Anchor, technically, which is owned by Spotify. I love that it was called Anchor. It's Consider. called Down at the Boathouse, the series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's only two episodes so far when we started this project a while ago. At the beginning of the pandemic, actually, is kind of how when we started this project. And um, it's taken longer than we thought it would, but each episode gets better than the one before. So. And, and if, oh, yeah, you Google, if, you Google, if you Google down at the Boathouse podcasts, CBB's podcast link is the very first thing that comes up. Woo woo. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so I think if there's no other questions or anything, Josh, do you want to say anything to wrap up or? Uh, just a huge thank you again to everyone that's been involved in this, especially Sarah for Culture and Historic Seattle. I mean, I can't thank them all enough for Colleen Wagner for making this happen, really setting these, this in motion. Um, it's really been a great process to be a part of and we're gonna keep going forward with it. You know, we're no means done. Um, and the timing couldn't have been better <laughs> for all of this, uh, with the landmarks coming up in our auction and celebrating our 45 years. Um, so yeah, thank you to everyone. Hopefully you guys can all tune in tomorrow for live stream of auction. We'll have a zoom chat. Um, you'll be able to walk around the floating buildings. I, um, I personally am the one who put most of the information into this um, digital walkthrough. So I tried to hide all sorts of good little informational nuggets and links and further histories on various aspects of the buildings or the boats or how they got there. Um, so you could really spend a couple hours with it. Um, it's just kind of the start uh, actually of how we're gonna do uh, digital exhibits moving forward. Um, so a lot of good history. Um, and our auction and this talk really is just the start of how we're celebrating our 45 years and continuing to tell that story the rest of the rest of the year really is what we're doing. We have a lot more planned. So um, it's nice to see it all start to come together. So um, thank you all to coming. Hey, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. This is fantastic. Thank you. That's really great. Thank you. See everybody tomorrow. Yeah, hey. see you tomorrow. <laughs> Bit early, bit off, and bit high. Exactly. <laughs> Don't wait till the last minute. <laughs> no. Yeah, you're going to give us a heart attack. <laughs> Thanks. Hey, good night. Bye-bye. Night.